<laughs> um, hello, it's good to be here. I'm so sorry that I haven't been able to journey with you all week, but um, I did manage to sneak in last night and so had the privilege of catching Andy preaching up a storm. And I was actually really encouraged because Andy and I had just had a cup of tea a couple of days earlier where he essentially did that one-on-one -on -one about, we've got to be raising young evangelists and what are you doing, Miriam? And okay, I'm really sorry, Andy, I'll try harder. And, and so then to come here and then here and do it again, I was like, oh, well, at least he's authentic. Like he does, you know, he did say it over a cup of tea and then he did say it to you lot, so brilliant. Um, I, I work for a charity called Fusion, um, who, so I know some of you through that because um, Fusion basically exists just to get behind and cheer on the local church to be phenomenal with students. We're really interested in your sixth formers heading off to university, having been fully prepared for that life transition. We want your 18, 19 year olds to hit the ground running when they get to university and thrive in their faith. We want them to have such a good theology of local church that they don't take a holiday from the family when they leave home, but they find automatically where their new local church is. That's why we do student link up, just what it says on the tin. We link them to new local church so that when they arrive, they can be the inviters of their friends to come and know more of Jesus and meet the family and meet the father for themselves. So uh, we've got the fusion stand going on in the main building. Um, you're really welcome to come and check out how we'll help you resource your young people and connect any one of you that's going off to uni or your kids. We'll connect them and introduce them to new local church. That's our whole deal. Uh, and my job within fusion is student mission. Anything to do with talking to current students about um, who are you telling about Jesus and what does that really look like? That's what I'm bothered about. That's what I'm interested in. But of course, the overflow of that is um, I want to ask you the same question. Who are you? telling about Jesus. Can you think of the names of those people? Do you know them? Are you journeying with anyone that doesn't yet know him? And what does it look like for you to be the invitation of God? So I was really encouraged that this conference is about having confidence in the gospel, because if you can't have confidence in that, then what can you have confidence in? You know what I mean? So brilliant, no brainer. Um, and, and I love it because uh, I just feel like uh, God's brilliant at a narrative, isn't he? So I feel like this is just an overflow of Andy from last night. Because today I really want to talk to you about courage. And what does it mean as you leave this place to walk out of here, walking in courage? How might that change the way that you do tomorrow, the rest of your life, next week, your workplace, the school playground? What does that look like? Um, I just finished doing a two-year road trip um, to every university location in the UK in a bright orange 42-year-old um, camper van called Benedict. Uh, <laughs> it's been quite a journey, to be honest. Um, actually, um, I don't know whether Matt knows this yet, my colleague Matt's down there. Um, the exhaust pipe fell off on the, on the drive down to New Wine earlier this week um, on the motorway. <laughs> it was, it was, it's quite awkward, actually, because um, he's just come out of the garage and he's, like, in the best condition he's been internally. And... Um, and uh, I'm driving down this ridiculous, I live in York, so come on the north. Um, so I live in York and I had to drive all the way down to Shepton Mallet with this, this camper van. And we're at a 50 mile an hour speed limit, which seems to be most of the country at the moment. Anyway, what a nightmare. So I'm driving along and this very nice white BMW pulls up alongside me. Um, and then they start beeping me. And I'm like, I often get a bit of jip on the roads when I'm driving that because it does look like... Um, it does look like a joke, to be honest. It's this massive, bright orange. It looks like a toy, but massive. So driving along, and she's beeping, and I have to wind down my window, and that takes ages, and she's done hers. And, and she shouts something at me, um, and I, I sort of half ignore her. To be honest, I didn't really know what she was saying. I'm like, all right, cheers, mate. She's sort of going, get off the road. And I'm like, no, <laughs> carry on. Um, past the service stations that would have been the natural and sensible place to get off carry on driving. A bit later on, she comes up alongside me again. And I'm like, okay, she actually does really want to. Beep, she does want something. Okay, you are right? And she goes, your exhaust has fallen off. I'm like, brilliant, cheers. And I just thought, I've just got to get to Shepton Mallet. So we're just going to carry on. We're just going to carry on. When I, went, when I stopped at a service station to get a cheeky coffee, I then got under the van and thought, oh yeah, that's definitely gone actually. Like that, that pipe's just not there anymore. <laughs> Oh, how serious is that? So um, I took a photo, sent it to my mechanic, who's now like my bezzy mate, Steve from Doncaster. Bless him. Because we, we've had so much chat about the van. It's honestly, I think, um, he'll probably invite you to the wedding, you know what I mean? Like, he's one of those sort of guys now. be godfather from, to my kids or something like that. Anyway, so um, I text him a photo of this exhaust and just go, on a scale of one to dangerous, Steve, how okay is it to carry on driving? And he's just like, number one, Miriam, you've had it two minutes. How have you done that? Number two, it'll be louder, keep going. I'm like, brilliant. So uh, anyway, I've survived and I'm here. So in a way, um, the Lord is still moving in power. Thank you, Jesus. But um, 
the, the road trip, when I started on this road trip, I was sort of like, aside from genuinely getting to every university location and hearing the story of the local church and equipping that local family for what it means to reach this generation, I asked God, well, what can I bring? What can I do? It's, it's, just, it's just me in a camper van having a go for the glory of God. Like, what can I do? And I just felt like God said to me, honestly, Miriam, your main aim is to bring courage, encouragement, to infill with courage my church, my family, my body. If that's the one thing you do, bring courage. Whenever you meet a brother or sister, bring courage. Let them know that Emmanuel, God is with us. Bring courage. And so we're, we're, we're going to sit around the call to courage that Jesus gives us. Um, you, you might want your Bibles open for the journey or to turn them on and swipe to it. We're, uh, we're going to be sitting around in John 16. And this phrase has been going through my head for ages. So I just thought um, we'd camp around it. And uh, it's Jesus' call to us. Jesus' call to courage. John 16, verse 33. At the crescendo of a journey that we're about, I'll, I'll take you through in a minute. Jesus says to us, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, have courage. I have overcome the world. The Amplified Version says this, in the world you will have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. So we're going to take a journey through the last few chapters of John leading up to that crescendo moment where he commissions his disciples, his followers to take heart, have courage. But first, a question for you. My local church, G2 in York, is um, we meet cafe style on a Sunday. So um, we, I'm really used to getting people chatting. So I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you do that. So um, what I want you to do is just chat with the person next to you. Um, introverts, don't worry. It, if it takes you longer to think of something to say, it will be better when you come out with it. But uh, extroverts, this is your time to shine. When was the last time you were brave? When was the last time you had to do something that took courage that took a deep breath moment that was out of your comfort zone when was the last time that you showed bravery I don't care how small it is or how big it is what springs to mind when if you can think of it was the last time you were brave just a minute tell the person next to you Okay, okay, bring it back. Introvert, sorry if you didn't get a chance to say the better thing. <laughs> There'll be time later, and it will be better. <laughs> um, I, wa I wonder what you could think of. I wonder whether that was easy for you. Uh, I wonder whether that, that was, uh, you instinctively knew, or whether actually you had to rack your brains for the last time you might have got out of your comfort zone, which is interesting. Just note that. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do, so um, I'll tell you the last time that um, I was fully uh, pushed out of my comfort zone, and uh, actually, it, it was to do with them. a month ago, Fusion created, we created something that um, we never had done before, but we basically wanted to capture, bring back more of the kind of spirit of adventure than it means to follow Jesus. We, uh, we're really passionate that students don't stay comfortable or stay in holy huddles at uni, but really get into the culture as salt and light, um, and 
which you guys know all about. And um, so we wanted, how can we capture a spirit of adventure? So we created something, we invented something called Escape and Pray. And uh, the idea was, the premise was that you get in teams of two to four people, um, student teams, student workers and their mates, that sort of thing. You show up at an airport, you get given an envelope. In the envelope are plane tickets to somewhere in Europe. You have 48 hours um, to get to this city in Europe and a series of dares. You don't have any money. The idea is don't take bank cards, only use your phones to like record and document it. No um, booking things, ordering pizza or any kind of way, cheating like that. Um, everyone was given 20 euros. The idea was to try and give away or give back the money at the end. And loads of people just straight away gave their money uh, before they left Manchester Airport or whatever so that they'd have nothing. Um, 48 hours, no accommodation, no connections, no food, no plan. How many local churches can you meet and encourage? How many university campuses can you get to and pray on and for? And uh, how many people can you tell about Jesus? And just this series of basically go on a God adventure. What might happen when you're fully available and you're just there to be a blessing to that city? No agenda. Um, and he may or may not provide in the ways that you want him to. Escape and pray, right? Uh, which, which actually was off the chain. We had like over 120 people sign up from around the country. Most of them we didn't know, having a go. So good news to the student world because something's bubbling up there. Anyway, uh, I ended up going to Milan. Um, no one could speak Italian. Um, I had a f I'd been smart with my team. I had a f someone fluent in French. I had someone fluent in Spanish. I had someone fluent in German. They sent me to Italy. Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> um, and we were out of our comfort zone right from the start because we missed our flight. Brilliant. <laughs> Just got the wrong check-in time. Hilarious admin error. But um, uh, bizarrely, thank you, Ryanair, um, they were like, oh, there's no flights out to Milan now till uh, a week's time. I'm like, brilliant. That's not gone well. That's not, that's not the dream, is it? That's not the ideal start. And then this woman goes, and we're praying, hence escape and pray. And um, this woman goes, oh, this is bizarre. There are four seats left of a, of a mystery group that... This is their return flight, but they never went out. So there's just these four seats sat together. Every other flight is full till next weekend, but there's four seats remaining. Do, would you like to? Yeah, I think we would like those flights. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm like, I believe in Jesus. This is what Jesus does. Thank you, Ryanair. Anyway, we, so we had a, a series of adventures out in Milan. I had some um, very interesting moments of, uh, of faith where we would ask in the name of Jesus and expect to receive dinner and didn't, okay? Ask in the name of Jesus and expect to receive inner city accommodation and didn't, okay? And I've got a brand new Christian with me, two students, and, uh, and God was not afraid to take us way past what we thought was an appropriate time to provide. <laughs> <laughs> he was... Uh, to be honest, we all learned a lesson about if you fast more, that wouldn't be such an issue that you didn't get fed till one in the morning. You know what I mean? Like, well, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> learned something there. Um, and so there were a series of moments that uh, God took us out of our comfort zone. But the biggest one happened about 10 minutes after what I will now refer to as the famous last words quote. Um, I was walking around in the center of Milan. We'd just um, gone to the cathedral and not found any Christians there. They didn't know anyone that followed Jesus, which was a bit mental, to be honest, but there we go. And we were walking around and we were now in the subway, um, ready to go home because God had provided us a home for two days, an Italian mum who was a professional chef and cake decorator and four beds. Thank you very much, Jesus. So we were about to go home. As we're, in the, as we're walking to the subway, my friend Joe, one of my teammates, says to me, Miriam, I'm trying to work out what's out, out of your comfort zone because clearly talking to strangers and talking to strangers about Jesus isn't. Now, has that always been that way or have you learned that? And I said, well... Um, I've always talked to, you know, I have a bit of a nightmare as a kid because I'd always talk to strangers. Like, I'd just go and join someone else's family at the park and just, just be more fun that, you know, like they're doing isolates. Why aren't I in your family? You know, mum's like, you, you can't just keep doing that. So the stranger thing I said to Joe, I think that's always been too in my comfort zone, to be honest. Um, I said, talking to strangers about Jesus, learning to name drop Jesus in conversation because actually that's authentic because he's my best friend and he's with me. So of course he's going to come up. That is a habit that I've learned. And I'm an evangelist, there's a disclaimer, but that still is a habit that I work on. So I'd now say it is in my comfort zone to mention Jesus to strangers um, and friends, but for him to come up. And I said, you know what, Joe, famous last words, my, um, what I think is out of my comfort zone still, what I still struggle with is to pray for healing there and then for somebody that I will know, we will all know if it's answered or not on the spot. 
You know, it's not one of the wishy-washy prayers where um, I hope this happens and we can never be quite sure because we were never specific enough to, let, to actually check up whether that was uh, answered or not. I'm talking about, I said that if I were to meet, particularly if it was someone that I didn't know and couldn't, couldn't journey with, maybe it was just a cold contact stranger scenario, and um, they were injured or in, in such a way, we're all going to know if God answers that or not. There and then on the spot, that is out of my comfort zone. I still find that hard. I still find that hard. Famous last words, right? Ten minutes later, we're walking uh, in the subway station. And uh, as we come to the top of some stairs, there's a man lying at the bottom of the stairs. Stone stairs. And um, we must have missed it by about half a second. Um, He'd clearly just fallen down the stairs. And um, he sat at the bottom. He's uh, he's on the floor. He's clutching his ankle. He's sweating with pain. And um, his family are rushing around. He's a Muslim man. His wife is there. His child is there. There's clearly some other family members and um, there's now a bit of a panic going on. Um, and uh, that is a nightmare when you've just said what you've said to your team who you're leading, right? <laughs> so and, uh, awkwardly, we were with two, um, we'd found two Christians. We'd found two Christian students. We just spent two hours with them, encouraging them, praying for them, prophesying. This was not the time for an event to happen when everyone's going, Tell us, show us more of this Jesus you speak of. (laughs) Uh, So he's at the bottom of the stairs and this group of Christians come up and we're like, oh no. So we walk down the stairs and this, just the disclaimer, nothing about this story is particularly holy from my part, right? We walk past him. (laughs) And then half the group have already bottled it, right? So they're like, I don't know what to do about that. Um, the other half don't speak English anyway, so we're not entirely sure what they're thinking. And then there's me and Joe, because Joe knows the conversation that we've just had. And I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm doing not a holy dither, just a dither. I'm dithering. Um, oh, I walk down the next set of stairs and back up. Oh, I'm back up. And, and then I make the uh, legitimate excuses that um, would still stand today had I walked away. I said, I don't think he'll let me pray for him. Um, he, he's a man, he's Muslim, that the whole scenario is probably quite inappropriate. Um, we, we'd already um, t- been talking to loads of Muslims about Jesus because there's a huge refugee crisis going on in the centre of Milan and the station and we were, got stuck in with that. And uh, the Muslim guys uh, just did, didn't want us to pray for them, um, only if we married them, so that wasn't going to happen. So there was... That was <laughs> Just not an option. <laughs> like, all things torment. No, not all things. Not going to do that. Okay, anyway. So, um, um, so I, was, I made all those excuses. Um, and I go down a few steps. And I go back. And Joe's going, what do we do? And I'm going, what do we do? And I thought, Miriam, you are wearing a t-shirt that says escape and pray. You, oh my goodness, girl. If you don't do this now, when are you going to do it? Like, come on. And so, um, in True to form, I basically, if I, I just have to fully run at it. There's no kind of in-between with me. It's the same with bungee jumping, right? If they say if you don't jump in the first 10 seconds, you're not going to go. So uh, the first time I bungee jumped, I just launched myself because I was like, this is how you do it. You just take a running jump. They were like, we've never seen anyone do that before and you probably shouldn't have done. I'm like, right, sorry. Anyway, um, so um, I'm going halfway down the stairs and I think, escape and pray. What's the point? If you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? And I just ran into this group of Muslims. At this point, they've... <laughs> They've picked the guy up. They've got a couple of, um, of the train staff to um, help him, subway staff, find a chair. And they've had to carry him because he can't walk. And uh, so they've sat him down. And, and I ran right to the middle of the room. And I went, do you speak English? And he went, no, Italian. I'm like, brilliant. Uh, so that's another moment you could just walk away, right? Anyway, and then I went, French? And he went, yes. And I was like, brilliant, Joe. So Joe comes to translate. And then um, he sat on this chair um, just holding his ankle, looking up at me. And, um, and I said to him, um, I can't help you. <laughs> there, is, there is nothing I can do for you. <laughs> no, and then I said, um, Joe's translating, and I said, but I do know Jesus Christ, and I do believe he can help you. Please can I pray that Jesus would heal you right now? And this was amazing. He lit up like a Christmas tree. You know when you just find people at peace in the most unexpected places? He lights up and he just goes, yes, yes, yes. And I was like, no, no, no. And of course, we've got an audience now, right? (laughs) Right. Translate. So I'm like, do you mind if I um, touch your ankle? Can we? And he's just like, go for it. I'm like, 
brilliant. So down I go. Joe's kind of translating in his ear. And I was like, right, don't, not really sure what to do here, but I don't know how much French she's got, so we've got to keep this short, because I don't know how much of the kind of healing translation she's done. So I just said, um, so he pulled up his trouser leg, showed me his ankle, just laid a hand on his ankle and said, pain, go in the name of Jesus, and um, ankle, be healed in the name of Jesus. I stood up, and he's sitting there looking at me, and I went, do you feel any pain? And he went, no. And I said, okay, wait, wait. Can you move your ankle? And he's moving it, he's going, yes. And I was like, nah, wait. <laughs> wait. Stand up and stand on your ankle. He stands up. I'm like, uh-oh. Wait, walk. <laughs> and he literally does this, he goes, me, gives me a massive hug, and then his wife is like, to their little boy, like, Hamid, get a photo, get a photo, I'm like, <laughs> praise God, right there and then, right there and then. And so, we got this, fam we got family photos with the whole team, and he's standing there like this in his photo, and um, and, 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 I mean, I, I was as blown away as him. He's jogging up and down the stairs now, right, as we're getting the next subway. And I mean, I'd, obviously, I went to him and I said, um, this is what Jesus does. This is what the name of Jesus Christ does. He heals you. He meets you. He knows you. He loves you. And there was this weird subway celebration going on, and I'm, I'm relieved. <laughs> and just, I, I was just going around just being like, oh, my goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Because, you know, when you got the whole team there, and we were all blown away, blown away. And so, the dangerous question I'm going to ask you, what is your famous last words quote? What, what do you say? Oh, so this is in your comfort zone. And this is your, what's out your comfort zone? Just to the person next to you, if you dare, what is out your comfort zone? Articulate it. Go for it. Okay, remember this moment, remember that quote, take note of what you've just said, take note, pay attention, I'm not saying that you'll have it within a 10 minute, um, from when you said it to when uh, God challenges it, but just so you know, God is in the business of pushing your comfort zone so you have to step into his presence. God uh, made you to need Jesus, so uh, he is definitely going to want to take you to a place where on your own you just can't make it work, where you're at the end of your strength and your ability. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for me on Escape and Pray was something very simple that I've taken away, but we just decided as girls, before we got to the airport to fly out to Milan, we decided um, we weren't going to blag anything. We weren't going to use any of um, the the classic ways that being four girls in Milan, you could have just got accommodation sorted, got dinner sorted, just been a little bit clever about it. We just decided to lay down any, um, any of that, any blag, any natural ability. And if God didn't provide in the way we asked him to, then he didn't provide in the way he asked, that we'd asked him to. And we would be okay with that because we weren't prepared to um, get away with it all ourselves. So just... Note what you said there. So we're just going to step back and look at the preamble up to the climactic uh, call to courage of John 16. So do you want to turn back to John 13 with me? And uh, we don't have time to read all these chapters, but I just want to highlight and draw your attention to the context in which Jesus calls us to take courage, to take heart. 
um, because it's huge and profound, and it basically changes the whole nature of how we might think about courage. Um, so in John 13, which is where the kind of episode starts of Jesus and his disciples being together, um, it starts with Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And what caught my attention about this context in terms of courage was that Jesus washed Judas' feet. Judas was still there. And Jesus got on his knees before him, knowing in the very next breath, Jesus then articulated, once he'd washed his followers' feet, one of you is going to betray me. And then off he goes to do just that. Courage in the face of suffering starts straight away as Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Jesus predicts Peter's denial in John, in John 13 as well. That's got to be hard. Saying to his best mate, yeah, actually, you're, you're going to act the opposite to how you think you're going to act. You're going to leave me. You're going to deny me. Jesus models courage in the face of friendship, in the face of trouble. John 14, Jesus starts comforting his disciples, which is outrageous. Given the journey Jesus is on and where he goes to next, he takes his time to comfort his followers. He doesn't make it about him, which is crazy, given how close the cross is. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. My father's house has many rooms. If, there, if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you so that you will be with me there also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. He's comforting his disciples. Then Jesus declares, actually, he's the way to the Father. They will do greater things than even he's done as he goes to the Father. So Jesus is talking about courage in the context of, I'm with you. I go ahead of you. I've prepared a place for you. And I'm empowering you. John 15, skip on. Jesus, again, he talks about remaining in him the vine and the branches. Again, he commands, well, he commands sacrifice. He says you've got to love one another. You've got to lay down your lives for one another. This makes sense. If we're going to talk about courage, what does it look like? Well, he goes, lay life down. Die to yourself. Your life is not your own. But he says that a gift that we get is complete joy. Okay, so joy comes in here now. Something around the courage thing also completes joy in us. Take a breath. Jesus then gives us a heads up again. In case you haven't got it so far, Jesus says again, you're going to be hated by the world because I'm hated. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And later on he says, they'll treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Heads up, Jesus guarantees trouble. He promises it. We're starting to see why he might call us to courage. Then Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to work on behalf of the Father in you. On my behalf, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. There's a promise of his presence in this context. John 16, again, Jesus says, you're going to have trouble. I'm letting you know now so that you don't fall away when it hits. Heads up. And then again, he describes the work of the Holy Spirit. Straight away with the trouble, he goes, and this is what my presence does. This is why he's the comforter, advocate, helper, defender, protector, counselor. This is why the Holy Spirit is who he is. Then Jesus says again about joy. Joy comes back. He says, your grief, it will turn into joy. Again, complete joy is another theme It comes back. Knowing the Father, not being able to be taken away from him, complete joy, peace, trouble, building up and up and up to our moment in verse 33. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, have courage, for I have overcome the world. And what happens after that big moment, that call to us? Jesus prays that he will be glorified. He prays for his disciples that they would glorify God. Again, more joy, more unity, more protection he prays over them. 
John 17, verse 5, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, trouble. John 18, Jesus finishes praying and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane where he sweats blood, is arrested, beaten up and crucified. And this is his preamble of courage. This is our saviour. This is the context in which he's comforting us. If God's going to talk about courage, look at this last few chapters of what Jesus walks as he calls us to courage. This is not a God who has not walked it. This is not a God that is not living it in that very moment. He knows the cross is right there. And he says to his followers, take heart, have courage. It's a sobering end to those five chapters. It makes me sit up and pay attention to his call to courage for us. Courage isn't just a bonus. It is a necessary requirement of following Jesus. What does courage mean? My, my psychologist friend says, it's to pursue a goal in spite of internal or external opposition. Why do we need to have courage if we're not being opposed? Why would Jesus call his people to have courage unless we were coming up against something? You know, if you track the, the word courage in the Greek throughout the New Testament, the word courage is wrapped up in some key contexts. Firstly, it occurs when there's healing or salvation. There seems to be a, um, courage goes hand in hand with seeing a miraculous breakthrough of the power of God. So quite often Jesus will say like, um, take courage, stand up and walk. Take courage, your, your faith has healed you. And he uses the same word that he calls us to encourage when there, there's healing or salvation that takes place. Notice that. When was the last time that you were in a climate of needing courage because of healing or salvation? Have you ever realized that, of course, that isn't just going to be always an easy, natural overflow, but courage and seeing miraculous breakthrough have to go hand in hand? Secondly, the next time that courage is kind of used throughout the New Testament is in encouragement in the face of fear. This is when Jesus often talks to his disciples, don't be afraid, have courage. Don't be afraid, have courage. When was the last time you were actually afraid in a way that you needed Jesus to say, have courage? Back to the question about when you were last out your comfort zone. Why would Jesus call us to have courage unless we were in circumstances that required it? Finally, the word courage is used for confidence and boldness. And Andy was brilliant at modeling that to us last night. Why would we need courage unless we're being bold enough to actually have a go at sharing the good news and see if someone might actually respond? I don't want my friends to just know where I stand with Jesus. I want my friends to know where they stand with Jesus. But that is going to take confidence and boldness. That's going to take the kind of courage that Jesus calls us to. And so when I think about this context of courage and I realize I cannot be courageous unless I'm getting into trouble... I figure there's two kinds of trouble that we're going to get ourselves into. The first kind of trouble that I think is a guarantee has nothing to do with the fact that you follow Jesus. The first kind of trouble that I think we need courage for to live this life as human beings on this planet is the kind of trouble that happens when you are born into a world that is not fully restored and redeemed by God. My mates who don't know Jesus go through some horrendous things. My mates that do know Jesus go through some horrendous things. I think there's a kind of trouble that is what a product of a world that is broken, a world that needs saving. You know, there's, there's cancer. There's, uh, there's um, like incredible injustice, both in our society. There's a bunch of you that won't have jobs at the moment because there's been huge injustice gone on for you. Uh, there is extreme poverty just because you were born somewhere different. There are natural disasters. There, there are so many groans and achings of the world. You know what's really, uh, it just struck me about the parable that Jesus shares about the wise and foolish builders. Everybody gets a storm. Everybody gets a storm. The difference is when the storm hits, what are you standing on? What are you standing on? Because everybody's going to get a storm. Welcome to being human on this planet. The storm is coming. The question is, is it sand or is it solid rock that you're building a life upon? Everyone gets a storm. And so I know for some of you, it has taken a lot of courage for you to even get here this week. 
It takes you a lot of courage to get up in the morning and do your own life. It takes a lot of courage for you to parent your family, for you to go to that context in the workplace, for you to live on your street, for you to deal with your family, your background, your past, your context. I know it takes courage just to be human. That is why we need Jesus, because you weren't supposed to do a breath without him. In fact, you cannot even breathe now without him. So of course it takes courage just to be a human on this planet. Of course you need God. Everybody gets a storm. And the second kind of trouble that I think is a little bit more unique to us, the second kind of trouble that I think is a reason why Jesus says to his followers, says to us right now, take heart, have courage, is a holy kind of trouble. And this is where I particularly want to press on you, like, just press your comfort zone. Are you getting into any kind of holy trouble? Are you troublemaking for the kingdom in any way in your life? What does that look like? So aside from the fact that I know it takes courage just to do this life, just to keep putting one foot in front of the other, following after Jesus, I know. But I want to get into the kind of holy trouble that Jesus says, you're going to require courage because you're going to end up in places you are not expecting. You're going to end up praying for Muslims in train stations that you are not banking on. Why? Because when the kingdom starts breaking in, it is a mess. Grace is so messy and brilliant and exciting and an adventure. And you were never made to play it safe. Of course you weren't. You were never made to stay in a holy huddle. That's why we're salt and light because we're out there. The holy kind of trouble I'm talking about is the kind of trouble where the early disciples end up consistently getting arrested, beaten up, arrested, beaten up, but they couldn't get imprisoned because the authorities went, literally, if we imprison these guys, there will be a riot. They are causing so much of a stir because as they go around, they're healing the sick, they're casting out demons, they're preaching the good news. Everywhere they go, they can't help it. They're causing holy trouble all over the place and the authorities go, I want to arrest them, but there'll be a riot. So they let them go and what do they do? Peter and John get back into the room and they say, God, give me more boldness. Come on, because the overflow of courage is more courage. When you start getting bold, it produces more boldness. Are you causing any holy kind of trouble? Are you causing any trouble? The kind of holy kind of trouble that means in your workplace, when someone says, oh, I've got a bad shoulder, you actually pray for them. You don't just go, oh, I hope you get better. You don't just go, I'll pray for that later, which is my cop out, by the way. I do that all the time. I'll pray for that. That's a way of name dropping Jesus. I'm, I feel happy about myself. Brilliant. Evangelist. Done. No, Miriam, pray for them there. Invite the presence of God into that situation. Shake up the workspace and prove there is no secular space where you are because the presence of God lives in you. So start to see it break out. Are you causing holy kinds of trouble? Are you inviting the Holy Spirit in? Are you giving prophetic words to people that don't know Jesus? Are you saying, this will sound really bizarre, but I was praying for you earlier, and I just wondered, I feel like God wants to speak to you today because he loves you and he knows you. I just wondered, would this resonate with you? And then share it. Have you ever just messed up other people's comfort zones? Because they're quite happy going, good for you, but not for me. And then we step in and go, trouble is though, Jesus really loves you. Like, it's not just about me. He's actually chasing you down. And so I just want to step in there, hold, hold the door open to the Holy Spirit, Spirit and say, God, you are so invited. Are you causing any holy kind of trouble? The holy kind of trouble that means when you see injustice, you don't just go, product of a fallen world, nightmare. But you do an Esther and you go, I'm going to go where it's going to cost me maybe my life to stand before the king and say, um, that's not okay. It's not okay. And that might be the littlest injustice down your road in the school with a family next door. It might be the biggest one where you're advocating for something massive. It might be that you go up in front of the kings of our society. But let's be holy troublemakers like Esther that could have had a cushy life in the palace and went, I'm going to request an audience for the king, which might get me killed already. And then I'm going to stand up for a people that you're trying to wipe out. Why? Because in, in the kingdom, we've got to see this thing break out and break in. And it's going to be through us because Jesus said, it's better if I go because it's going to happen through you. So are you causing any holy kind of trouble? The holy kind of trouble that means in this culture full of idols, where people are chasing down security of money and the career ladder and that conveyor belt. Are you on the conveyor belt? Have you just realized that you're just going along in your nice normal life and you tip off at the end and trip into eternity and praise the Lord, but who's going with you? Are you going to recognize anyone when you get there? Are you just looking exactly the same as everyone else, but you're nicer and you don't swear? What? That's not causing trouble. 
I'm talking about the holy kind of trouble that means you end up in a lion's den. That means you end up in a furnace. That means you end up on a cross. Jesus didn't play it safe, did he? He got killed for causing a holy kind of trouble. Please don't let the highlight of your year be a tent. Please don't let the highlight of your holy trouble be what you prayed here rather than what you walked out prayer in action when you leave this place. I really want to see you lot in way more trouble. I want to hear stories on the news and from your church leaders and in the universities because you lot just couldn't shut up. You just couldn't stay silent. You couldn't stay at home. You couldn't keep your bank accounts full. You had to keep giving away and giving out and praying and inviting the power of God. What holy kind of trouble are you causing, salt and light? What are you going to do? Because we don't have very long on this earth. Our life is but a breath. I don't want to go down fighting. I want to go down causing as much holy trouble as I can. So that if nothing else, when I show up and I can't take anything with me anyway, I can show up and go, well, we got into a lot of kingdom mischief, didn't we, Jesus? I want to get everyone to give me a hair ruffle and go, you're an idiot, but I love you. You know what I mean? Like, just have a go for the glory of God. So what was your famous last words quote? What is out of your comfort zone and into a holy kind of trouble? What's it going to look like for you with your friends to just push in past the comfortable, I know you're a Christian, that's really nice and push into something of the presence of God encountering them? What's it going to look like in your workspace? Because you know there's actually some corruption going on there, and you've just let it slide because it might cost you your job. What's it going to look like with the family next door, and you know there's stuff going down, but you, you, just, you don't have the time or capacity to get involved with anyone else's life because you're, only trying, you're just trying to hold yours together? What would it look like to say, Okay, what if God is the ultimate parent and we were meant to be together? We were meant to live next door. We were meant to be good news to next door, not just our own family. What does that look like to share this thing outward? What I'm simply going to do to finish is just give a moment of space to think. What's going to take courage for you? What would be a holy kind of trouble for you? And what I'll do is I'll pray for us I'll give us a moment to ask the Holy Spirit if I'm going to stand up and say, I want to cause trouble. I want to have courage because I'm actually going to live a life of trouble and joy and presence that's going to require courage. Then in your own time, when you know why you're standing, then just join me in standing up. So I'll pray, I'll give some space. Then when you're ready, stand up. And don't stand up because you're going to sing again. Don't stand up because everybody else does. Stand up because you've stood, you've sat with Jesus and said, I'm in. I'm in for causing trouble. I'm in for needing courage because I'm actually living a life that requires it. So when you stand, you know that's a declaration between you and the Father. You know that's a declaration within the family that I stand up and tag in for being courageous. Tag in for causing a holy kind of trouble together. So let me pray for us. And then when you're ready, if you want to, because it's a dangerous prayer, stand up for courage. So Holy Spirit, thank you that you're already here. Presence of God, I ask in the name of Jesus that we become more aware of your presence in us already. Presence of God, thank you that you are with us. You will never leave us and you will never let us down. The gift is God with us. Thank you, Jesus. And as, I, as I'm with my family members now, Father, we give you space to press the edge of our comfort zone and challenge us. We give you permission now, Father, to call us into courage, knowing with eyes wide open, we get trouble, we get peace, we get complete joy, and we're going to need to take heart. So we give you space, God, to call your people to stand in courage.
as people stand, Holy Spirit, will you just um, highlight to them who, who are the people they're going to have to start to step out their comfort zone towards? What's the context, Father? What's going on in their workplace, in their family? Where are they going to need to get brave because there's going to be trouble? Holy Spirit, thank you that the overflow of the presence of God in us is boldness. And thank you, God, that courage isn't a gift, but the effect of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us means that we walk out in courage. Thanks that it isn't as easy as you just get handed it. Actually, you've got to walk it. The very nature of courage means that you press on and press in. You don't get it handed to you, you push in. Lord Jesus, you can see your family standing, saying, we're in. Jesus, you see each one of us. And scarily, God, whatever it looks like, we're saying, we're up for it. We want to cause a holy kind of trouble. So Holy Spirit, fill us with your presence. We stand as a family. And I declare that the breakthrough starts when you leave the tent. I declare that uh, walking out in courage, this is the preamble. This is the preamble to the main feature film of your life where God is the main character and amazingly he's written you right into the adventure story. Father, thank you that there are so many people we're going to meet that don't even know they're part of the story yet. And that because we're going to cause a holy kind of trouble, we're not going to accept the status quo. We're going to push in, push through and see breakthrough in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, actually, we picture the people that are closest to us that don't know Jesus. We picture those that we've been praying for, sometimes for weeks, sometimes for years, sometimes our whole lives, God. We picture the names and faces of the lost, those that don't yet know you. And once again, as a family, as we stand up in courage, we want the courage to be part of the breakthrough. So we ask in the name of Jesus for there to be breakthrough and salvation. Father God, we ask that this year we would not play it safe, but this would be a mission critical time. That Father God, we would have an urgency back, an urgency back for sharing you. Thank you for this room of troublemakers, God. Thank you for this room of troublemakers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.